morning. My name is Rainy Williams. I will be sharing this presentation on invasive species once I figure out. Sure. While you are playing with that, I'll um, encourage students to ask questions in the chat if they come up during the talk. Um, but if you want to save them to the end, that's fine too. But sometimes putting them in the chat, we'll just, we'll cover them at the end. That way you can put them in there when you think of them. And yeah, we'd like everybody to partake of the, the question and answer session afterwards. All right, Migrich. All right, I'm not used PowerPoint and I'm okay. Oh, there we go. Everyone see that? Okay. All right, so this is, I'm not Kate Hexton, obviously, but I am with the DRM for Leech Lake, and this is her presentation that I will be going through. Uh, Bacan and Goji Gandag Dog. So that's a term non native invasive translation. Um, so we're trying to, we try to move away from the non or the invasive word kind of, just because it's so negative, I feel. But it's our goal is to maintain or improve the ability. You can read that. Um, this kind of goes through how an invasive species becomes present in a local ecosystem. So you have your introduction there, which would be, you know, bringing it from somewhere, maybe through a, a boat or somebody's soil or somebody just planted it because they thought it was pretty. Um, eventually that would spread out depending how well it does in this climate, it would spread out to where we actually see it being a problem there. We call that early detection, which is hopefully we can find the isolated population before it spreads into the next stage, which is, it's pretty much out of control. Um, after that, that's when the public starts noticing something's not right with it say like zebra mussels or any kind of aquatic in this area is a big one just because there's so many fishermen, anglers, I should say. Um, so yeah, that was when you start management and control is usually pressure from public, but we would like to, I don't know if you'd see my cursor, but we would like to get it. Well, obviously preventing introduction of the species is most important, but detection, early detection and rapid response right in that area is the the main goal of the DRM, I would say right now, besides, you know, everything that's already here is obviously being managed, but we would just like it not here at all. That's about climate change, so let me leave that. So just think of what do you think of threats or invasive species, I guess, non-native beings. Um, you know, there's things that you wouldn't even think to be a threat to our local area, but uh, things like zebra mussels, obviously, um, hopefully my internet's working and saying it's unstable, but uh, zebra mussels are bad for our fish populations. Uh, things like purple loosestrife you might see on the lakes and rivers, big purple flowers everywhere, bad for our minoman, our wild rice, um, just things like that. Uh, Weeds even in the ditch, you know, there's some stuff like poison ivy would be considered noxious. It's native, but parsnip is one. Wild parsnip, it can be damaging to actually your skin. Oh, I don't know if that is. This is like some clear cut. Oil spills, obviously. Um, this looks like, well, this would be an example of some, I'm not sure what that is but an example of a species just overtaking something that's bad for obviously power lines, so bad for humans, but also bad for native beings in that area and they all compete or grow. I think that's kudzu, isn't it? It's a picture of... Uh... Yeah, kudzu. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, it can grow like but two feet it looks per like day. Somebody's taking over. Okay. Here's garlic mustard. We are currently 
in a plan to eradicate this with the Chippewa National Forest. All those white flowers are individual plants and uh, kind of see it just taking over the whole forest floor. There's no diversity, diversity there. There's no, um, you know, it's just taking over everything and spreading it all into these trees. Garlic must is a big one because it can grow in shade or full sunshine. So it pretty much goes anywhere. So that's bad. If you can think about the impacts of that, you know, there's no diversification there. The soil is getting eroded. The uh, the native plants are being outcompeted. You can see under there, there's some foliage that they just can't grow just because this stuff is everywhere. So this emerald ash borer. So for an insect, it's, we don't we keep an eye on this, but we don't deal with it in our department just because of plants. But it's obviously an invasive. It does affect the woods or the ash tree, which is important to Ojibwe culture and basket making and whatnot. Data um, is behaving badly. That sounds like a, a rabbit group. Eastern large beetle. Okay. I'm not sure about that one. I haven't done anything with that. So it's affecting, it looks like some conifers free there. Earthworms, you don't think of earthworms as being a problem just because you always hear, you know, worms are good for your garden, but there is no native earthworm to Minnesota. To the US, I think on this side of the, on the Eastern side of the Mississippi is what I remember, or the Rocky Mountains. So obviously earthworms, you know, they live in the ground, so you don't see them too often, but uh, they're very terrible for soil health, especially in our hardwood stands. Um, they'll totally deplete the soil of all nutrients, which trees like the maple, sugar maple, they just can't grow it. There's a whole soil composition that goes on about, uh, you know, fungi and bacteria and all this whole thing we don't even think about going on and earthworms just totally destroy that. So you can actually physically see damage when you look at the for forest floor that's being uh, infected by earthworms. So that looks like a road. I think her point, Kate's point here was just destructive. Uh, earthworms, you know, if you're going through mud, Worms can get on your wheels, you're driving all the way through the woods, you know, you don't think of earthworms spreading miles and miles, but they're not doing it themselves, you know, they're, they're being attached to these ATVs or logging trucks, you know, all that sort of stuff, and that's how they spread logging. Fishermen dumping their bait, that's why they tell you not to dump live bait, you should destroy it. So yeah, that's my point there. Um, there's a lot of things that rely on healthy soil, not just plants, but the things that eat the plants, the water table, all that stuff, the erosion, they can all be affected by earthworms. As you can see a healthy forest there on top, lots of plants, you know, lots of diversification. Um, and then after that, when the earthworms move in, things just can't grow there as well as they would without them. Emerald ash borers, you probably heard of that one. Really bad for ash trees. They think it might not come quite this far north because it gets so cold, but obviously with climate change, that could change rapidly. Know your ash. So it looks like an ash basket. Um, not sure what else. Ripstick. It's just a gypsy moth. It's another insect. 
I'm not too familiar with this one. I'll skip that. Eurasian water milfoil, it's an aquatic plant. It, uh, makes these dense mats here that affect fish breeding grounds, um, water quality. So there is a native one, the Northern milfoil, that would be here natural. Um, obviously it has found its balance in our local econ or e ecosystem, whereas the Eurasian water milfoil is just taking over. Uh, it has nothing to bounce it out. And then they are hybridizing, so that's a problem. See the difference there. If, for identification, I took a workshop on this and it's, it's really hard with uh, aquatic plants, but there are certain tricks like the leaflets are different just slightly. And thankfully there is a weevil that eats Eurasian water milfoil. That is an ongoing, um, ongoing situation that we're trying to get into, I guess. Uh, we're trying to collect biocontrol agents, which would be this weevil. Biocontrol being the use of a plant or animal to control a non-native being. So this would hope the idea would be you plant you give a bunch of these weevils something they like to eat, such as your modern rail foil. They disrupt it enough that it controls the population to a point where you can go in and either manually pull or at least keep it contained to a smaller area. So. So control is not all about mowing, pulling, spring. Um, like I was saying, chemical or biological control is important. Uh, I don't know what her point is with this actually. Let's see. There's not, oh, well, regardless. So garlic mustard is in this picture. I don't expect anyone to know which one it is. It's the Smittal one. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can see though uh, that it looks similar to native plants. Wait a minute. So yeah, you gotta be very careful when you're out and about actually controlling some of this stuff. You could disrupt a natural, a native being instead. So this is for garlic mustard. Um, it's one of the first plants that we try to control every spring because it does go to seed early and it can seed twice in a growing season if it is a mature plant. And then it produces tons and tons of seeds per plant. So they actually grow and then they pop spreading seeds up to like a meter circle, I believe. Pretty crazy. Um, Leech Lake does not use herbicides. We have taken that policy on and we stick to it. We do not like to kill things with chemicals. I personally believe there is no good end to that regardless if you achieve your goal or not, it's you're introducing something not natural to the ecosystem. This is some past crew working here. This is, you can use it in a salad. I know Kate's made uh, pesto with it. And then biological control for garlic mustard is, has not been approved, I do not believe, by the FDA yet, as far as I know. In Canada, they use it. They have a beetle that will eat the seeds in plants. And that is it, I think, for this slideshow. Wow, thank you. Um, we have one question right away in the chat from Sydney. 
since it's December 4th and we're seeing little to no snow and it's been pretty warm outside, does that pose a threat for us and invasive species? Basically, how does climate change intersect uh, with these right. non-native beings? Yeah, so more broadly, I would say that these milder winters just with climate change would affect invasive species. It would affect them positively, but obviously our native ecosystems negatively by giving them a gr longer growing season. You know, like garlic mustard, for example, if that goes to three seed cycles in one year, that would be ridiculous. And if you think about it, that would increase population potentially by 50%. So it was from two to one or two to three, that would be problems. As far as things like, if we had harder frost, deeper frost into the soil, I'm sure it would be a good thing for non-native beings just as they're not adapted to cold potentially, but it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that one of the controls for emerald ash borer that you mentioned that might be just a little too cold up here for them? Yeah, that's what some people, it's, it's debated because it hasn't, it's slowly coming up this range. But if you just think about how cold it gets up in this zone, I guess, or whatever, uh, temp mm -hmm. climate, temper, temperate zone, yep. whatever they call it. But, uh, you, yeah, US. Yeah, it just gets so zone. cold. Yeah, it, the cold would penetrate the tree so hard that potentially the larva and stuff wouldn't survive. That's has to be seen yet still. All right, well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, how close is it? It's in Minnesota, southern Minnesota. It's central Minnesota, too, I believe. I'm not, I'm not totally up to date on that, but. OK, it's so it's not close it's, enough it's, it's to. Cool. Yeah, but it's not like in a neighboring county. I mean, yeah. one, one fifth, I'm sure. I'm sure it's around here somewhere. You know, there's. It's. I know there's some reservation, maybe Grand Portage, that was doing stuff about it, like preemptively. So it's definitely a concern. Hmm. And I don't want to say that it'll never be up here because it's so cold, because I don't know. Yeah. Great question, Sydney. Um, anybody else want to put something in the chat or ask out loud? Feel free. I'll wait for another question to come in. I've got one. How many lakes in our area have Eurasian water milfoil? Or I mean, like in general, how often I do we believe, see it? So on Leech Lake Reservation, I believe we have two infestations that we know about on okay. a Cass and Leech. So the big They're lakes. There might be more. Townline Lake has one that's just like on the border of the reservation. I'm sure there's more lakes with it. It's a, it's not hard to identify, but it's a newer threat to the area, I would say. So that's the importance of early detection and rapid response is once again, getting this either, you can't prevent it, obviously just human nature, but, uh, Finding it early is very important for invasive species. I mean, I didn't know that Cass had Eurasian water milfoil. So that's, yeah, that's good to know. But, but so, I think it was Cass and Leech Lake were the big one. Yeah, there is the um, EDS map link that I put in the module for the class. So you guys can actually take a look at this. Yeah, that is really helpful. Yeah, we can uh, figure that out. Oh, who's your little one? Is she a in? I have a question. Um, so when you use like pull something from the ground, how, what do you do with it after? Uh, we're removing it manually. We just bag it up and then burn it. So that way, there's no seeds that would be alive. Mm. Otherwise, if it's something that we pull that's not seeding, 
we can leave at the site and it would theoretically die and uh, produce more seeds. How did garlic mustard go wild? I mean, is it, was it a, um, so I mean, it sounds delicious. The only population right now is, yeah, it's, it's very pungent. It smells like garlic mustard, <laughs> but uh, it was used, we believe, for food. So somebody planted it in the garden, you know, and then it spread so easily that we think that's what happened. Hmm. Does the DRM bring awareness to the reason? Uh, yeah, so we are working on that more. That's from Sydney. Thanks for the question. Um, we are, like this summer, we had two new infestations of zebra mussels that we posted on our social media page. And the Bajaman, obviously, but we're not sending out flyers every time to every household or nothing like that. But. But yeah, that's one of our goals is wearing, uh, raising awareness so somebody can go into the yard and say, hey, this is not native, call us up. We can hopefully do something about it. Um, speaking of doing something, is there any hope that our lakes won't be terribly damaged by zebra mussels? I mean, what options do we have at this point? Uh, not much. The prevention is our strongest case, I would say. Didn't we lose that battle, or is because it still worth fighting? I think it is. You can ask other people, but I think it's worth protecting any that's kind of the myth with zebra mussels too. Is everyone's, oh, they're already in every lake and river. There's no point. But uh, it's something like 5% of lakes in Minnesota have zebra mussels. And that's it. You know, you just, it's a shame that they're the bigger, more, more popular ones usually. Because if you think about something like Lake Winnipegashish, there's so many landings there that there's just not enough resources to check everyone's boat. So big lakes tend to get it quicker, faster. But uh, I think it's worth trying to prevent other people, other lakes from getting it for sure. Okay. As far as the lakes that do have it, is there any hope for eradication completely? Probably not, not right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from students? Who wants to uh I'd like to plug that we are looking for help this year? Oh yeah, let's talk so about if that. Wants a job in the invasive species. Um, we normally have at least one intern and then summer positions, which are paid pretty well for the area. We are looking to hire in June, depending on how the pandemic goes, of course. But well, yeah, um, Kate and I are actually we're looking on. for watercraft. Yeah, yeah, you normally provide us right, with the interns. Yeah, and our internships typically pay 15 bucks an hour and have somewhat flexible schedules yep. on occasion. So it's a great way of, yeah, definitely. We are. Yeah, of making a difference and, you know, seeing if you know, natural resource management is a career that you're interested in after college. Oh, um, anybody else have a question? No? Well, um, please join me in thanking Raining for joining us this morning. Um, it's great to have the update from our local natural resource managers and Getting that perspective is, is really useful. For me, it's surprising to go from the language of, you know, aquatic invasive species to non-native beings. And just thinking about that paradigm yeah, shift. That's a, yeah, I was at a workshop, the tribal adaptation menu, put on by Glyphwick, and they kind of drilled that into us. And I agree completely with it that uh, it's not, it's not the plant's fault that it's here. So. 
we can't be mad at the actual plant you know we gotta we gotta see that in a certain light of it's a living being and it's here and you know and we are killing it or trying to but we can do it in a respectful way and we can under, we can not have an am animosity towards it oh i hate zebra mussels with a passion but perhaps it's my own personal issue <laughs> But we got one yeah, more. Yeah, so yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, how do you? Sure. Yeah, okay, one more question here. How do you make everyone adapt to the environment friendly ways in the day to day life? I mean, how do, I mean, how do we get people on board to help prevent the spread of these things? Um, I think just that's a good question. That's a question I think a lot of people are trying to answer, yeah. but uh, just bringing awareness to do you think people see. generally want to do the right thing stakeholders like this. what's that do you think people generally want to do the right thing i think so but uh you know just we did a couple inspections for both this summer just a few and most people were on board with it but then you get the crabby guy you know and doesn't want anything to do with anybody, especially his boat and stuff. But I think just making people aware of how it affects that their local fishing hole or their, you know, their favorite hiking trail stuff to bring a, a personal attachment to it, I think helps a lot. Of okay, and I love this question. How does the zebra mussels, how do the zebra mussels affect the wild rice beds? Do we know? Um, as far as wild rice, I do not know. It can affect the water quality. Um, like you look at Lake Winnie, that's, I believe the meaning of Winnie Magashis means like muddy lake or dirty water. And you go over there now, even when I was a kid, that lake used to be pretty cloudy, you know, and then you go to some spots now and it's, clear you can see to the bottom and three feet of water and so all that you know people think oh you know nice clean water that's good but all that stuff is important for that that lake environment that phytoplankton that fish fry feed on that you know obviously the ecosystem and the life cycle of everything the food chain but wild rice i'm not totally sure um but i'm sure it has some some effect on it. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about that one too. We kind of walked through um, how nutrient cycling would be affected with a massive zebra yeah. mussel infestation, but it really has to do with how much I think yeah, I'm nutrients sure. would be immobilized. All right. All right. One more yeah, question. Yeah, I'm sure that's a good question. Um, we're focusing. Yeah, no, well, I was gonna say question. a for purple loose stripe is a big one for wild rice, just because it kind of likes the same habitat, slow moving water, you know, shorelines area. So once the, and that stuff once that gets there, it's it's hard to get out. Right, Sydney has another question. So when you say affect the water quality, this poses a negative threat to the fish, right? You're talking about, um, this is how zebra mussels are changing the water quality, right? Yeah, so I don't know about the chemistry of it, if it's uh, like the actual, chem but so zebra mussels are filter feeders, which means they, they obviously sit somewhere or whatever, plant themselves and they let the water come in and out of them. Um, so what that does is they take all this, I guess, micronutrients. I don't know if that would be a correct term. Um, but uh, things that the, native fish would need, right? I think plankton primarily, they're planktivores. Yeah. So, you know, you don't think about walleye eating little microscopic plankton, but fish fry and other things that walleyes do feed on, feed need that stuff so mm -hmm. so i'm not talking about uh chemical quality you know the 
pH balance. Stuff. I'm sure there might be some kind of effect on there. I don't know, but as far as water quality, I mean, just for, I guess, habitat quality. Well, we had a good discussion the other day about how zebra mussels would affect areas prone to eutrophication. And I haven't quite figured that one out yet either. So I think it's an area of research that we're gonna to have to get into. All right, well, we've got about yeah, 10 minutes of, left to handle class business. So thank you so much, Raining. I really enjoyed this. Um, and we'll be in touch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be in touch soon and uh, invite you back. My email's out there, Kate, email's out there. Yeah, anyone needs a job this summer, for real, we could use the help. Wonderful. Chai Miigwech, thank you very much.